Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, June 26, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, today we start out with a couple of possible false positives from antivirus. The first case is BitMessage. That's a piece of software that a reader submitted to us after it was flagged as ransomware. As far as Didier is able to tell, uh, this copy of BitMessage is genuine and does not include ransomware. But BitMessage has been included in a number of ransomware cases to allow the victim to communicate with the author of the ransomware. So what possibly happened is that antivirus companies saw BitMessage as part of infected systems and then categorized it as ransomware. And FileZilla, a GUI program that's often used for FTP on Windows and Linux, is in hot water about possibly adding adware to its download package. Now, this all, again, just like the prior case, came to light when antivirus all of a sudden started flagging this particular piece of software. Now the tricky part here is that all the software downloaded and the part that's being flagged by VirusTotal or by various antivirus engines is a legitimate part of a file Scylla. However, like so often with free software, the creator does try to make a little bit of money. So in this case, FileZilla includes some ads and some additional offers that allow people to download additional software. None of this looks outright malicious. You may consider it adware, but that's really sort of one of the gray areas when it comes to virus scanners and malicious software. Usually it's really just called unwanted software instead of calling it outright malicious. But one thing that really is illustrated by both cases, ultimately it's really impossible to prove that software is not malicious. So in the end, you have to do your tests, you do some reverse analysis, but really hard to determine that any software doesn't have a malicious component. And one issue that has made the news often on the last couple months is the existence of so-called Craylock devices. These devices can be used to brute force the pin that is used to lock an iOS device. These devices connect directly to the lightning port and in doing so they are bypassing some of the rate limits that are imposed on users using the on-screen keyboard. Well, Apple has been working on fixing this particular problem in upcoming versions of iOS, but Friday a researcher posted a video claiming that he has found an even faster and more efficient way to bypass pins via the lightning port. Now, at this point, Matthew Hickey, who originally discovered this issue, has shared details with Apple, but hasn't really released anything else. One suspicion that came up over the weekend, and Matthew kind of uh, confirmed that this may be actually a problem here, is that while he was able to feed these pins at a relatively high speed to the device, uh, these pins may not necessarily have all been validated. So it's possible if you're feeding the pins too fast that the right pin may actually be skipped. Uh, like I said, no details known yet at this point. And the standard advice as usual is to use alphanumeric passwords to lock your mobile device. And one trend that we have certainly seen in the last years is that cloud accounts are a huge target for things like phishing, credential stuffing, and any kind of password attack. So it's really very, very important that you are using two-factor authentication for these accounts. 
For Acer, at this point, it's not mandatory to use multi-factor authentication, but Microsoft is going to change that, and Microsoft released a preview for what they're calling their baseline security policy, which will be applied to all Azure Active Directory accounts by default. This policy does require multi-factor authentication for administrators and privileged accounts doesn't require it for all users, only for these higher level accounts. And yes, you can turn it off if you absolutely don't want multi-factor authentication. Now, Microsoft does offer a number of different options when it comes to multi-factor authentication. Phone calls and SMS messages are still on the list, but you can also use Microsoft's Authenticator application if you don't trust SMS and phone calls. And then we have yet another interesting, maybe not very practical in some ways, exfiltration and site channel attack that uses the battery levels in mobile devices. Mobile device batteries are increasingly smart and offer a lot of optimizations, which leads in this case to the ability to actually detect what keystrokes are being pressed based on the current flow from the battery. Now, this in itself is of course interesting. It can be used as a keystroke logger if you have access to accurate battery levels. JavaScript started to expose battery levels to the browser, which of course could then be used to read keystrokes. However, it turns out that the resolution of the JavaScript API isn't quite there where you need it in order to actually sample the battery level fast and accurately enough to detect keystrokes. And that's where these researchers went probably a little bit less realistic, where they actually modified the circuitry of a battery to then exfiltrate data whenever the battery actually recognized that a certain website was accessed. It may not be a very practical defense for some of us, but probably the best defense against these side channel attacks is to avoid multitasking and to avoid having multiple websites or applications open. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.